Today, you are going to get a front row seat to the short but impactful Springbok career of Richard Bands. Richard, welcome to Front Row Rugby. Thank you. Pleasure to be on your show. Now, before we get started, let's have a look at today's trivia question. In 2018, the Springboks started their international season in Washington, D.C. against Wales. Who captained the box that day? Now, if you know the answer to the question, you can put it in the comment section down below. And we'll also find out if Richard knows the answer, but we'll do that at the end of our conversation. Richard, your name is Richard Edward Bands, but we know that you're an Afrikaans guy. What's the story behind that? Yeah, just after the, the, the Anglo-Boer War, uh, a lot of Irish guys uh, came into the country. And uh, so my dad's half Irish and I'm, I'm half Boer. So my, my mom's surname was uh, Dreyer and, and my dad was Bans, of course. And uh, yeah, so I'm a little bit of a half breed. Uh, Miss playing for Ireland, I think by uh, one or two generations. So yeah, I settled for the box there. <laughs> I think we're all really happy that it did work out that way. Let's go to 2003 when you made your Springbok debut, test cap, first one. Talk to me about how you were feeling. Look, it's uh, it, like, I, like I said to the guys, you know, you get the high road and you get the low road if you go through high school. And I come from a small little school called Lichtenberg in the Western Transvaal. So, um, so it was, you know, taking the low road, you know, you had to work twice as hard as, hard as the other guys to get into the Springbok colors, you know. So, so no, it was just, it was just an awesome feeling to know that all your hard work that you put in over the years actually paid off. Richard, you were 29 at the time that you made your Springbok Test debut. It's quite late by most international standards when you consider that some guys make their debut at 20, 21, 22. Do you think that you appreciated it a little bit more? Yeah, of course, yes. Uh, look, uh, when while I was farming, um, I didn't play rugby for four years and, uh, and I had to make a comeback. So, um, so yeah, it, that's the, I think that's the main reason for me being a slow bloomer. But um, if you look at the stats, you look at France Malherbe and all those boys that actually started playing their best rugby at the age of 20, 27, 28. So I was just, um, you know, Heineke picked me when I came into the circuit in, in 2000, you know. So, uh, yeah, no, we had just to work hard. So a little bit of a slow bloomer, but I think I was mature enough to, to, to enjoy uh, the Springbok colours immensely. So as we said, you made your test debut against Scotland. We won that series 2-0. And then we played against Argentina at the old Butte Rasmus Stadium. Uh, I've actually driven past it uh, not that long ago, and uh, there's not much left of it. But nevertheless, uh, that day against Argentina, Louis Kuhn had to kick a penalty right at the end for us to win that test match. I know that you're not a kicker, but when you're standing there and Louis is lining up the kick, what is going through your mind? Well, his finger crossed and you pray like crazy, you know, because it, it, was, a, it was a tough it was a tough test. And uh, luckily, you know, uh, Louis is a brilliant kicker and he slotted a, a lot of points for us uh, against Crusaders and all over. So uh, we were almost always certain of his kicking abilities. But yeah, no, that was... a. Uh, it, it, his timing was good on that one. <laughs> That's for sure. And then after that, we had a really nice win against Australia in the Tri-Nations at Newlands. And then, unfortunately, at Loftus against the All Blacks, we received a hiding, 52-16. How devastating was that? Yeah, look, it was tough. We, um, you know, we were a team that was building at that stage and uh, a lot of new guys in the test squad. So, um, yeah, we, they call it the Jan van der Riebeek Toets. So uh, 1652. So uh, being being a bull and to playing at Loftus and used to winning there, to get a hiding like that was was look no no rugby player plays to lose. But um, at that day, Carlos was just magnificent. He was just uh, that's why he's called King Carlos. He was just magnificent and he 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 he, he shredded us to bits on 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 ten. You know, so it was just it was unstoppable. You got your revenge against Carlos uh, a few weeks later, but we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later in this discussion. Firstly, I just want to ask you, after that defeat to the All Blacks at Loftus, what was Rudolf Strauli like in the dressing room? Look, everybody was quiet and, um, and, and disappointed, of course. You know, to get a hiding like that wasn't nice. You know, 
It's, it's like I said to the guys: if you work for somebody and you and you don't and you don't perform, it's only your boss that's angry at you. But if you play for the boxer, you get a hiding like that. You read it in the newspapers and on TV. So no, of course, um, uh, it it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't nice. But being professional rugby player, you need to put that behind you and and focus on the next game. And then we went to Australasia for the away league of the Tri-Nations and I said we'd discuss it, Carlos Spencer. It's a moment that put you into Springbok folklore forever, Richard. You received the ball, you went on this incredible run, you handed off Spencer on your way to scoring an incredible try. Describe that for us. Look, playing with Joost in, in, in the full squad, he had the ability to, to get the forwards quickly in the game, running off his shoulder and putting playing us in the gaps. Um, but but um, Tape Henning was our advisor on on the refereeing, and, and and he always said, you know, the, the refs always has a little bit of a chip on their shoulders. Uh, they'll ne- they'll never blow the whistle to say that they're in the way of of running or the ball, whatever the case might be. And I thought, well, if the ref doesn't is not going to blow the whistle, then maybe the ball the the gap is where the ref is. And uh, I just ran that line and US with that ability. To play me into the gap, and uh, straight through, and looking for support, and no one was there. And I had to go at Carlos, and uh, yeah, scoring, scoring the corner. Uh, it was just an unbelievable experience. Um, scoring a try against the All Blacks from 50 meters out, you know. So, uh, but it must, it, it was very sweet revenge at Carlos, of course, for that 1652 test. And as I say, it's a moment that made you a Springbok legend. Uh, just something interesting, Richard. I have watched that back. I mean, that try is on YouTube. It's uh, easy to find. And as you mentioned there, you pretty much ran 50 meters. You showed incredible pace. I'd be very interested to hear when you compared yourself to the other props that were around in your era. How did your pace compare? Um, well, we did the test at the box. So uh, on 25 meters, I was... Uh, the quickest in the whole, of the whole squad, and on 40 meters, I was uh, the second quickest. Just Brighton beat, beat me on that, and then of course 100 meters, I was stone lost. So, so nobody runs 100 meters, you know. So, so yeah, look, uh, earlier years I used to play flank and at school. So all my years I played flank, and then uh, and then uh, in the trick I moved to hooker, and after and then Heineke moved me to tight end. So I was always an open side flanker. So the, I was pretty quick over the first 10 or 20 meters. So I think uh, I, I've got a lot of white, white twitch fiber as well, explosiveness. So yeah, it's just a little bit of a freak of nature, I suppose. Before the World Cup, there was this thing that took place called Kamp Staldrad. It's become notorious. Richard, I've had lots of former Springboks on this show that have all told me their stories from Kamp Staldrad. What's your story? Yeah, look, I think it was an absolute disaster. I think uh, SA Rugby could have thought this one a little bit through a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it was said to us that if we, we don't complete Comp Stars out, we're not going to go on, on to the World Cup. But um, even even though the team was already already selected. So look, uh, we professional rugby players who we used to get a lot of sleep, of course, uh, for our REM uh, testosterone. And recovery, of course, and then uh, of course we used to five or six meals a day, and um, so uh, they took us on this camp and took our sleep away, and uh, we had no rest. They took our food away, so um, I, I think it was uh, one of those things. Uh, I think it will go down in in the in SA rugby as the biggest blunder of of what they was. You know, I I, I speak a lot. I've spoken to Cornei Krieger uh, regarding that as well, and and he and you know he, it it still bugs him today that he didn't man up. Well, I won't say man up. We maybe should have taken some more leadership and just get us out of there and just get back to basics. And you know we're there to play rugby. We're not there to go on a special forces training session. So uh, so no, it wasn't nice. Uh, luckily, I was one of the guys that still did. Some military, um, uh, I went two years to, in, in the military. So, um, we, you, you go into that mindset of this, this shall end as well. But some of the younger guys like Derek and Skulk and, and all those boys, they really suffered. 
Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not consider becoming a patron? It's my dream, guys, to do this full time, and with a small financial contribution, you can help me realize that dream. The link and the QR code is appearing on your screen right now, and I'll also put it down in the description area for you to go and click on at a later stage if you would like to do so. And by becoming a patron, I promise there will be great benefits for members. Now let's get back to the interview. Going into that Rugby World Cup in 2003, I think it's fair to say that the Springboks were not among the favourites. What was the atmosphere like in the camp? Look, we believed, uh, all like always, you know, um, we, we we up there and we just need to bounce the ball or a kick or so. And um, when, we, when we played England as well, I think we were pretty much in the game. Um, and Louis Kuhn, like we just said now, really was a, was a kicker of note. But what nobody knows is that his wife was hijacked that Friday night uh, in South Africa. And um, you could see he was, he was rattled a lot and, and we missed a lot of kicks. So, um, yeah, I, I think if we, if we knocked England there, I think it would have been good for our confidence as well. But, uh, yeah, unluckily, it, it didn't work out. So we had to take the low road as well and uh, getting New Zealand. And, um, yeah, and that was pretty much, I think, one of the worst World Cups that South Africa ever had. It started with a match against Uruguay where you scored another try for the Springboks. Uh, just talk to me a little bit, uh, because we've discussed England, but I want to talk about Uruguay. It's an opponent that today, they're actually quite a decent side, but certainly in those days, they were one of the minnows, no doubt about it. Could have been difficult to get information on them. And then the other thing is the Springboks would be expected to win big, as they did. 72-6 was the score. But it's one of those where if you win big, people say, oh, it's only Uruguay. But if you don't win big, then you get criticised heavily, don't you? Yeah, damn if you do, damn if you don't. So uh, it's always a, it's always um, a, a tough one. But but I mean, like you said, rightfully, you know, earlier years, Uruguay, Portugal, all those teams weren't really a team to to measure yourself against. And you know, running onto the pitch, they pretty much well know that they're going to get eighty points or or sixty at least. So um, yeah, where where they've been and where they are now, they've they've improved a lot. So um, yeah, it's 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 look uh, like I said, it's it's a tier three country uh, in for them or tier two to give them a hiding six to none is it's not really something to get your confidence up uh, for England game. You know, if if if, if you believe that winning uh, Uruguay by seventy points, you're pretty much in shape for England. You're pretty much much missing the plot. After that England game, you were actually on the bench uh, for the match against Samoa, which we won very nicely, and then also on the bench against the All Blacks for the quarterfinal. How disappointed were you by that? Yeah, look, um, like I said, it was uh, the morale of the team wasn't good, and and um, like I said, we knew we were going to take the low road, um, in, and we had a few crunch games, and um, so yeah, no, losing England, playing off the bench. Um, Look, we knew if we're going to take out Johnny Wilkinson, we we pretty much um, it's it, we we in the mix. So as Johnny was coming blindside, I lined him up and uh, and to hit the hell of it out of him. And then all of a sudden, I just woke up and Lawrence De Lalio knocked me from the side. So uh, so yeah, I had a little bit of a some skidding. So uh, in those days, they weren't ding dong tests or whatever the case might be. So uh, Uli woke me up and. Yeah, that's why I played the next test from the bench with uh, six stitches in the inside of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that the boys truly believed that they could beat the All Blacks in that quarterfinal? Look, that 1652 always sits in your sits in the back of your head, and and I think the All Blacks was just like always just a team to be reckoned with. You know, it's just they they they, they were phenomenal. Uh, you know, McCall was there, and 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 everybody was just they were on a up. And um, so, must I be honest? I never, th I, I don't think we believed in our abilities to 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 take them on. I think uh, in the Tri Nations, we just that test that I that I scored the try was was narrowly. But if if you look at the average of our test that the players played, I think we went into the World Cup with an average of about fifteen tests uh, per player. Uh, well, and, and statistics show that you, if you want to if you want to win a World Cup, 
average age must be 25 with an average test um, of 50 tests per guy, per, per player, and, and then pretty much, and, uh, and, I, and we weren't even close to that. That was also the end of your Springbok test career, Richard. How disappointed were you that it ended there? Yeah, very disappointed. I've been nominated in four of the five categories um, at, a, at our annual um, Springbok um, dinner. So I was nominated uh, Super Rugby Player of the Year, um, Players Player of the Year, Tri Player of the Year, and Springbok Player of the Year. And then all of a sudden, um, the, 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 there was a change of guard with Rudolph being kicked out and Jake coming in. So yeah, of course, um, nominated four out of the five categories and not even being in the mix for them next year. Uh, couldn't understand it, but um, I think that's... Uh, it teaches you a few lessons in life as well. You know, you get even even though you think you're an eye, you can you might get dropped for no reason whatsoever. But I mean, Jake did well from there on winning the World Cup. So um, yeah. Did Jake ever speak to you about joining up with the Springboks? No, we never had a discussion. Very interesting. So let's just go one step back because obviously you played your entire Springbok career under Rudolf Strauli. What can you tell us about him as a coach? Look, I think he's a brilliant coach. He, he, he did pretty well with the Sharks at that stage in the Super Rugby as well. I think he, he went into the semifinals. So um, I, I, I think Rudolf is a, is a good coach. Uh, was he the best coach for the job? I, I, it's debatable. Uh, if you look at our... If you look at our uh, Results. Um, I don't think we. I don't think, this, but but I don't. I don't think it's for me to judge. Um, I think he's a good man. Um, I know him off the field as well. Uh, very naughty guy, and uh, we had a few pints of beers as well afterwards. So um, I think it would be unfair for me to 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 judge him as a as a person. Or, but he's a brilliant man. He's and he's a good coach. He he's got that little bit of a kitsch crusty. Or would I say a, a, a John Williams maybe attitude of a, a, a do or die? You know, it's my way or the highway. In, and in some certain in some circumstances, that's good. I think uh, our uh, I think the one thing that we never we as players never felt secure in our positions because he he, he played almost like a little cat and mouse. Um, and and I think that's where Jake did. That, that right to say, look, you, you are my number one tight head. Uh, so Jake make the guys believe in, in themselves, the way he backed them as well. Um, and I think that's maybe where Rudolf missed, missed the plot a little bit. All right, Richard, who was your toughest opponent? Look, I think Kier's news from the All Blacks, he was an absolute freak of nature, a low center of gravity, strong legs. He was a beast of a man to 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 time, but um, yeah, I, I think his news was an absolute legend. And when you look around today, is there a particular player that stands out for you that you admire? Look, I love Marcel Coutier. I think he's one of the best flankers or eighth man. Depends where they play him. I think he's always heart and soul in, in the game and he's, he's leaving his body on the on the pitch every game. So I I, I know Marcel now for, the, quite, for a few years. It's, it's, it's a shame that he's not always in the in the box squad but as a man that I know well and as a player I think he's a, he's a brilliant brilliant human being and a, and a brilliant captain for the Bulls as well Is there a particularly funny moment that you can share with us from your time with the Springboks? Look I don't know what, what it is with me and Carlos but but yeah it, uh, except for the 1652 um, earlier that year we played the Blues and, uh, and he came around the corner uh, from from a, from a line out, and uh, I was folding far side, and he came running straight on to me, and he just off the shoulder come, comes Dougie Howlett, and he played him in the gap, and they scored under the poles. And as I turned around, he he chirped me and said, "Richie, mate, we passed you on the left." <laughs> so it's it's always this, that little banter on the pitch that's that's uh, that what makes the that what makes the game so so nice and so. So, so unbelievably awesome where, you know, you can, in, in our days, you can really intimidate the guy without the ball, if you, if you know what I'm trying to say. But, um, but off the field, you can always have a, a drink or a few beers in the cloaks, you know. So, um, so yeah, that's, uh, 
that's one of the stories that that comes up. Very cool. What are you up to these days? Um, we, we've developed some satellite technology in South Africa um, where we're going to help protect the farmers. There's a lot of farm, farm owners in, in, in our country and uh, me myself used to be a farmer. So um, I, I, we've, we've developed some awesome technology to, to protect the farmers. So yeah, that's what we're busy now, rolling it out. Sounds good. Let's have a look at that trivia question again quickly. In 2018, the Springboks started their international season in Washington, D.C. against Wales. Who captained the box that day? Do you know the answer, Richard? I think Peter Steff. That is exactly right. Peter Steff de Toy captained the Springboks. And then you'll remember, uh, I think it was a week later, we played a three-match series against England. And that's when Sia Colisi uh, became the Springbok captain for the first time. But Peter Steff de Toy, he was the first one uh, that season under Rassi Erasmus. Richard, let me say it was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby today. A pleasure to listen to those old stories. And I really hope that we can have you on again in the future. Thanks a million, Peter. And congratulations with your program. And uh, thanks for having me. Last time on Front Row Rugby, Dan Van Sale was my guest. You can go and watch that video. It's appearing on your screen right now. Next time, Mornay Fisser will be here.